Nashville, and Denver. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> DC ish. Nice. Nice to me. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm from Baltimore. So DC is like my little neighbor. <laughs> Very cool. Oh, a few a few other joiner here. That's great. Awesome. Yeah, why don't we why don't we just call it we'll give one more minute? Um, and then we'll just kind of dive right in. Yeah, for sure. And I do want to say for those of you, I'll uh, I'll sh I'll start sharing my screen. All right. I'll be the wing woman to Jesse today. Thank you. Yeah. Can you just confirm that you're seeing the correct screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, and for those of you that are uh, willing to stick it out until the end of this workshop, which will be done at 1 p.m. Eastern time, we have, I have a special treat for you, a gift, if you will. Um, so hopefully you have the time. If not, um, please connect with us afterwards. This is, I'm just really excited to connect um, and share a little bit about storytelling. So I think if, if we're good, we can get started. What do you think? Yeah, let's go. Well, I'm going to hand it off to uh, Jesse, who's going to take us through this presentation. We're very really excited. Um, and so, yeah, without further ado, Jesse, take it away. All right. Thank you so much. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here, taking some time out of your day and of your week to be with me. Um, so before we actually, before I, I dig in, I have like a... <laughs> Uh, a question for all of us. And the first question is, why are you here? What, what literally brought you to this moment? What made you want to sign up, put in your information, RSVP, and put in this in your calendar and then be here in this moment? Like, what is the, what compelled you to be here? Was it my, you wanted to see my beautiful face in the flesh? You know, was it, you had nothing better to do? Maybe storytelling is something you're really passionate about, but ultimately, I, I just wanted to ask this question because ultimately, why the purpose of you wanting to come here made you take the action to show up? And so I want to thank you for showing up and being here. Um, so three big things that I want you to take away from today with me. So number one, I want to you to understand why stories are literally the most powerful thing on this planet, on in this universe. Second, I would love for you to understand what makes a story effective. Obviously, there's so many different perspectives on this, but I'm gonna give you mine. And then lastly, how to apply a story um, to building a product, a brand, or a business. So how can you apply it to your own work and your own life? So if we can do this, I give you the universe <laughs> in your hands. So let's, um, first I wanna introduce Taylorou. For those of you that are new or uh, not as familiar with the Taylorou Collective, please check us out. Um, I'm a member. We're a collective of UX researchers and product designers. And we're really, um, we do create products with purpose. So we're very focused on impact-driven products and working with companies in that sense. Um, and then I also wanted to introduce a company that I founded three years ago, Rebus which um, Rebus, if you Google it, is an alchemical symbol for um, the hermaphrodite or the, the, the duality of male-female. Um, I love duality and I love looking at two sides of the same coin, um, but ultimately we are immersive experience creators and we also have pivoted to also become story consultants throughout the pandemic. So our most recent project, for example, we worked with someone who was developing a podcast and had hundreds of hours of audio, but had no idea what the story was. So. Um, feel free to check us out. But uh, ultimately, I want to introduce myself and ultimately why I do what I do in the largest scheme of things is I want to expand consci consciousness through storytelling. So what do I mean by expand consciousness? I want to create more empathy, connection, understanding so that we can all continue to grow, be more aware, open-minded. Um, and we'll get to the storytelling part in a moment. <laughs> but a little bit about how I got here to this moment, talking to all of you. Um, for, for probably my entire life, I had a misconception about outcome versus output. Obviously, I didn't use the word when I was five years old, but ultimately, I always believed that outcome was an end result and that, you know, as I started venturing down 
the product design world, it's like end results are bad. It's all about process, 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 process. Um, and if I relate this to my background, I come from a background in performance, musical theater. That's where my love of storytelling really comes from. I had this idea of Broadway or famous, and that was my outcome that I desired. And whatever output it takes to get there was what dro drove me. And then I realized literally like two months ago that I was totally misinterpreting <laughs> what outcome actually means. Outcome is not an end result. Out outcome is something you want to achieve, but it, it can be broad, it can be big, it can be truly, I want to expand consciousness through storytelling, can be a purpose for me that ultimately informs all the output that I do. So moving, looking back at, I want to be on Broadway, that's the outcome. It's very limited. Um, and I started to look at the relationship between outcome and output in a totally new way. And it brought me to design, um, ultimately because design is a function of connection. And because I want to build connection through experiences and stories, that's what brought me here to this moment. And my story is ultimately what ties this all together. This is the bridge between our desired outcome and the output that we constantly are doing, the feedback loop. So in a nutshell, this is what I do. Um, obviously, I, I mentioned I'm a storyteller, so I come from a background in acting, dancing, singing, choreography, um, writing. I'm also a facilitator, so uh, I do a lot of team building and game design. That's been in my, my past. Uh, and then as a product designer, I worked at Hello Ava, which is a skincare company that uses AI and machine learning to uh, recommend the best skincare products. Um, and now I'm with Taylor Roo Collective working on some really great projects. So feel free to find me on LinkedIn. I would love to connect um, and please reach out. So let's get back to storytelling. And I think it's really important to define what this word means because obviously it's used a lot and it's used more every day. But what does this word mean to us? So I always love to start with the etymology of story. Where does it come from? Um, and I, I encourage you to do your own digging as well, but ultimately in, in the history of the word story, it's a series of events. And then as it developed, became a way to create interest and to please others, to keep them engaged. And I think that's really interesting. This like, again, this duality of the two. Um, so with that, I wanna do a, a quick little exercise. <laughs> Um, and I want everyone to just take a moment, maybe scoot back from your computer for a second, find your two sits bones in your chair if you're sitting. And I want you to just close your eyes. Yes, entertain me. <sighs> and like, just let out some stale air because I feel like sometimes we get in Zoom and it's a little bit, you know, we're in our, our brains. So wash out some stale air. And I want on your next inhale, just to think of the first story that comes to your mind that really left an impact on you. And this could be anything. This could be a Netflix show that you just watched or binged, <laughs> which I have. It could be a children's book. It could be a poem, a song, a myth, anything at all. What is that story? Do you have it? If you're not sure, just the first thing that comes to your mind. And then open your eyes. And I want you to find your way into the chat if you feel so in inclined. And I want you to just quickly jot down in just a few sentences, what about this story compelled you? What about this story stuck with you? Um, and take, take, let, let's take like 30 seconds. Just first thing that comes to your mind, what about this story was something that popped into your head so immediately. And once you have it, once you feel like, okay, I've had like a sentence or two, just plop it in the chat. I'd love to see what other people came up with, what stuck with them. Um, and if it's something you wanna share, if, it's, if it is a TV show I should binge, please also put the name in there because I, I love consuming stories. Yeah, so when you're ready, mm. Lion King. I remember being like nose to screen watching that as a, as a child, very good. While we're doing this, I wanted to share a story that I really, only because it's so fresh in my mind, it's called Brand New Cherry Flavor. If you're not into horror, I wouldn't recommend it, but it's on Netflix. And ultimately for me, what stuck with me was the, the aesthetic was so specific. It's like set in the nineties, 
the way it's shot, there's so many interesting um, aesthetic elements. And also because I come from a background in the entertainment industry, it really is a, such a strong commentary on the predatory element of like entertainment. And that's what made me like really get into it. Um, oh, morning story from Seth Godin. I will definitely check that out. Yeah, amazing. I just, I wanted to do this exercise. Uh, the Giving Tree I love. Um, yeah, these stories, I'm noticing there's a lot of like personal connection to what this story did for you. And ultimately what I would argue is maybe it left you with something, a message or a, a question or a, a lesson perhaps that you took away. Um, or maybe it was like a something that per, felt, felt very personal to you. And I think that's very important to think about when we're talking about what makes a story compelling and interesting. So feel free to keep throwing that in there. Um, I feel like it's very interesting. I'm gonna keep trugging forward. Um, looking at the history of the word story. So obviously for millennia, stories were used to teach lessons. Um, and this was done through myths, fables, tales, songs. Um, but what's important here is myths were not, for example, lies or things that were in modern day thought as like, oh, it's a false story. These stories were believed by those who heard them for at that time. So in ancient Greece, they believed that these gods actually existed and they did these things. But what was inside, what was in the nugget of the story was a lesson, something to learn. So for example, Little Red Riding Hood is a lesson, don't walk alone in the woods, little girls. <laughs> um, so all of this to say, if stories help establish belief. If they give us a lesson or something to shift how we believe, then I argue sh stories shape our entire evolution of consciousness. And this is why it is so important to me. So for example, animals don't necessarily evolve as quickly because they don't have the same tools for communication. And they also don't have the ability to pass on stories and pass on lessons as effectively as we do as humans, which allows us to evolve quicker. So what I wanna say here is what we believe is directly correlated to the stories we absorb and take in and the stories we share. And that is truly the power we have. We have the power to shape our universe with stories. And at its core, it's communicating a, a universal truth or um, through a lesson or a lesson, if you will. And then at its best, it can conjure passion for a positive change, meaningful purpose, um, and obviously on the flip side, it can do the opposite. It can create polarization and hatred, but we're gonna stay on the positive side because I want you to wield storytelling for good, please. <laughs> I'll do the same. But what does that mean for us here, sitting here at 12, 17 p.m. Eastern time? Storytelling is a way to communicate our purpose, right? So what we want to achieve and how we want to achieve it is tied together with story. If we want to bridge this gap, and create products with purpose, because I argue that our consumers, our users, our customers, our audience, they want to connect with things that have a purpose and that give them a purpose. So I'm gonna now enter into this golden trinity. Well, I'm sure you're wondering after 17 minutes, what the heck is the golden trinity of storytelling? Can you let me know? Um, so I wanna give you some context to how I even got down this rabbit hole. As I mentioned before, Rebus is an alchemical symbol and I love alchemy. I love the ancient knowledge, the mystery of it. There's so much hidden research out there. So I wanted to see, okay, there's this, there's this trinity in alchemy um, in order to sort of um, uh, the philosopher's stone, which you can go down that rabbit hole by all means. But I wanted to see what patterns show up in other cultures through throughout time and space. So I wanted to just, at first I was just like, what are the patterns here? in this trinity that shows up in so many different ways. What are the similarities between these three elements? And then could I apply this to storytelling? Could this be a way for me to better measure what makes a good story, how to be a better storyteller, how to help others be better storytellers? Um, and so here's just some examples of trinities that I found. There are hundreds more, but even in physics, we see this trinity. So in biology, in physics, chemistry, we see this in Ayurveda, which is an ancient holistic medicine from India. Um, and I also find this interesting because it also illustrates the relationship between these three elements. So it's not just hot, dry, and heavy, but there's also the relationship between the two that ultimately creates these three elements, kapha, 
Pitta, and Vata. You don't need to know all of this, but I encourage you to explore that as well. But what I did is I just wanted to see, okay, well, where do the, how can I start to classify these things based off of the Holy Trinity, Naidan, which is Taoism, Ayurveda, alchemy, um, even writing. And I ultimately ended up with why, what, and how. These felt like these three questions, which I feel like we all hear a lot, are the core elements of what makes a good story. And I actually define them more specifically as context for why, content for what, and contrast for how. So this really like content, context, and contrast all make up a story. I could argue anything in this world, including a product, a business, has the, should have these three elements. And I say contrast, you might be thinking, what about conflict? Um, because in storytelling, conflict is a huge element of creating tension. But what I sort of had to grasp was that conflict feels very, feels very binary and very like kill or be killed, win or lose. Contrast is much more expansive and allows for an audience, for example, to learn a lot more about a villain in contrast to the hero. They don't necessarily need to want to kill each other. Sometimes they want, they might, the villain might want to conspire with the hero, but you learn more about that in contrast. And also um, I find villains more scary when they act really nice and uh, happy. <laughs> I think that's way more scary than a villain that's just acting like a villain. So all of that to say, I, I had this discovery and a week ago, I wanted to sort of bring this up because some of you might already know Simon Sinek and his TED talk back 12 years ago called Start With Why. I didn't. And I discovered this like a week ago and was like, oh my God, this is a really impactful and interesting. Feel free to scan this QR code and watch it on your own time, bookmark it. But ultimately what Simon was trying to get at was these three questions, why, what, how, which he called the golden circle. And I was like, oh my God, this is very validating and affirming that he's looking at this from a different angle in a way you could argue from like the bird's eye view. Cause I was like, well, I have these trinities, but, or I have these three elements, but what comes first? What's the, is there an order? Do you just kind of like focus on all of them at the same time? And what he helped me understand was actually the best leaders, the best companies start with why, and then they get to the how it works and what they're offering. Um, versus most of us start with the what and then the how, and then we eventually get to the why. So two quotes from this that I really wanted to pull out and share with you. One is people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And I feel like that is again, really affirming for the purpose behind our product. And then the goal is not to do business with everybody who needs, to, needs what you have, but the goal is to do business with the people who believe what you believe, right? And how do we do that? Through storytelling, yay. <laughs> so why is not only our belief, but it's connecting our audience with their belief. Because again, what brought you here today, again, and I'm assuming is you were inspired. You have some belief that storytelling is powerful, is impactful, and you want to learn more about it. And that caused you to take action to show up here. So what I had done with my what, why, how, content, context, contrast, I was actually more interested in the relationship between the two, similar to Ayurveda triangle that I showed, um, because ultimately everything in this universe is relational, relationship-based. Um, so we're gonna look at the relationship between these three pillars of storytelling. Um, first with content and context, so the what and the why. And just to illustrate that a bit more, content is literally the physical thing, um, you know, if it was a story, it could be the text, it could be the events. The context is why it's occurring. Why does it matter? And what I really feel like lines up here is, is the purpose. It's relevant to what's happening now, today, not 20 years ago, not 100 years from now, but right now for an audience. How does this relate to them? How does this relate to the world? Um, and I believe impact is a big part of this. Um, so a few examples. And you might already start to think of some that do this well. One is, oddly enough, Eileen Fisher, which is, she's a fashion designer. And there's a, a podcast that we can share in the chat that was really interesting around Eileen Fisher. And she basically developed her whole fashion line on sustainability. So she wanted to make sure she was sourcing the resources um, in a sustainable way, creating a B Corp so that she can, um, you know, 
give back to the communities that she's taking the resources from. And there, that was a basis for her fashion design. And that to me would make me, if I could wear Eileen Fisher, I would wear that over um, something that didn't have that clear context behind the contact content. Um, another example, a little more straightforward is the Trevor Project and literally in the tagline, saving young LGBTQ lives. Great, sign me up. I wanna be a part of this. Another uh, bigger company, Shopify, um, which as we're seeing them emerge as a competitor to Amazon, which I'm like, all right, yeah, let's go. Um, you know, one thing you see on the first page of their website is helping to small, helping small businesses to grow and thrive and giving them more resources to, you know, grow. And I feel like that's, again, it doesn't necessarily always need to be about climate change or solving world hunger, although if it can, that's great. Um, but ultimately, there's an impact beyond just wanting to make money off of people selling things. Does that make sense? Um, and then if there's any other examples that are coming to your mind of great brands, products, companies that have a good balance of this content and context, feel free to throw it in the chat. Um, Cause again, I love to just see where your, your brains go, what comes up for you. Um, and while you're doing that, I also wanted to quickly touch on what happens when we have a little more of content and a little less of context, for example, when we're a little bit out of balance. So we have a lot of content, that's great, but if we don't have a lot of context behind why it matters, what the purpose of it is, then it's just mass, it's just matter. Yeah, Patagonia is a great example. Um, yeah, and then in, in, on the opposite side, if you don't have a lot of like content or, or the function of something, but there's a clear context behind why it matters, Perhaps it initially creates a sense of purpose, but what do you do with that? So that's a little bit about the relationship between content and context. Now let's move to context and contrast. And this is where I, I sort of tried to classify it as like where passion lives. This is what gives your audience the passion to engage. How do you stand out amongst the rest? How are you as a business product brand standing out um, or in contrast with other companies, um, that kind of thing. So a few examples here to get your, your imagination going. One is Away. Um, and this is, again, solely on the product, not on the company culture. I won't go into that. But ultimately, personally, I was, I just like, uh, there was such a, a influx of people buying Away bags because it, they had a clear why to make travel as seamless and joyful as possible. And in contrast to how frustrating and cumbersome other luggage companies are, how, how, much, how much traveling can suck um, and how expensive other luggage was. So that, that's really like by balancing those two, it really created a, a product that I personally liked and like for better or for worse. Um, another example is if anyone remembers these who, uh, from the subway, if you are a New York city or uh, New Yorker, uh, there are these rebuses that were ads used for Casper, and it was just knowing their audience. So, you know, people are, and of course, this is an ad, but you're going to be sitting on a subway for 40 minutes. You're going to want to occupy your mind. So rather than a quick billboard that you're driving past on a highway, this was very specific to how to engage the uh, imagination of an audience. Um, and then Casper in general is just a, the wise because it was, I feel like, one of the first in its field to create this new uh, mattress that magically shows up at your door and expands and it goes up and, and it's comfortable. Um, and again, I'm not sponsored or supporting any of these brands. I'm just using them as examples. Um, but another example, if anyone is familiar with, um, yes, OkCupid, okay, good example. Um, Clubhouse is another example that I thought of. If anyone's familiar with that social, um, social media platform that emerged. And I find something interesting. I think uh, in terms of UX, a lot of people are like the exclusivity of it because you had to invite someone, you had to be invited to join, uh, doesn't allow for a lot of access, but I thought it was actually really smart because it, word of mouth and creating this connection to others made it feel more exciting. And in contrast to all these other open access platforms where anyone can join and anyone can get likes, this was like a little more specific. And then the why, of course, is wanting to connect, wanting to share knowledge, wanting to um, be on a platform beyond the visual element. I mean, even Instagram Live is an echo chamber to me, personally. Um, 
Yes. So, and then again, if you think about when we are out of balance here, um, if we know why something matters, so for example, uh, Clubhouse, we know that it's a new medium where we can use our voices versus our faces and our filters. Um, if there's not an activating way to make this interesting and to capture people, and it's just like, come if you want, uh, it's not that it's not effective, but it's not as effective as it could be. So again, it gives you an example of when it's out of balance, where are the opportunities here? And then lastly, let's move to content and contrast. And to me, this really intersects at the meaning of something. So what makes uh, your audience, your consumer or your user, any whatever you wanna call them, um, what makes them curious to continue using your platform, your product, your service? Um, what also, what do I need to know and how can I communicate that in the simplest way? So if you have an over uh, saturation of content and there's no idea of where my eyes supposed to go, what am I supposed to do? I tune out immediately. I'm like, I'm done. Um, and this is like, you, you could say uh, design is important here in terms of UI and the visual element of things to make the content stand out more. And also wanting to slim down the content. Who, who knows, like when you get that newsletter, that's like a novel. Oh my God. I'm not even going to read the second sentence, but if you distill it down to the points that I need to know, it's like butter. <laughs> so a few examples here that I wanted to pull out. One, I think this is more obvious is Apple. Um, you know, they keep it simple. They stand out amongst the rest in terms of what they offer and why they offer it, of course. Um, and that also, it, it's sort of fractal in their entire brand. So their space, their products, their website, everything is aligned with this idea of simplicity um, and knowing what to look at. Another, Two more personal examples. Bonza is an amazing chickpea pasta. This is me sh shamelessly plugging because my friend works there, but it's delicious. But ultimately their brand is this obnoxious orange and it's just like an orange box that says Bonza. But every time I go to the grocery store, I know exactly where it is. Um, so amongst the hundreds of gluten-free pastas, I know exactly what I want. And it also get, makes me curious to be like, wait, what is this? Uh, another example, is uh, Here Be Dragons is a really cool communications agency from UK. They do a lot of cool immersive activations, which is why I'm secretly obsessed with them. But um, they, if you just go to their website right away, big bold letters, obviously a dragon, it gives you a vibe. Um, and it also makes the content really focused and clear. And also there's a lot of cool interaction design on their website that I just am like, it just makes me interested to keep going. Right. Um, so th those are some examples here. And of course, if we try to think about the imbalance of the two, which I sort of touched on, I would say, you know, if you have a lot of really cool elements that help the, your product or your business stand out, you know, digitally, let's say, but there's really not a lot of content to latch onto. I need to know like, what, but what do you do? What are you going to do for me? What is the function here? And then, of course, like I said before, if you know the function, but it's just a bunch of words or it's not compelling to me, I will tune out. <laughs> so all of that to say, I wanted to add another layer onto this golden trinity and the relationship between them. Um, and a way to look at this is the, the link between you and your audience. Um, and I'm taking a, a note from Begin With Trust, which is a really great um, thing that was developed again, in Trinity form. This was focused more on leadership, um, but I believe it totally can relate to what we're talking about here. Because how, how do you build trust with your audience? How do you create that connection of trust? And this could also be if you're um, in leadership and you want to inspire others or build trust amongst your company. Um, that's ultimately what they're looking at. But ultimately there's three elements, why I care or empathy, what matters, the logic of it, and how I come across the authenticity. And I feel like that perfectly lines up again with the golden trinity that I had just illustrated. Um, what something they do talk about that I find interesting is where do I wobble? Um, I like that word and I think it's an interesting way to look at ourselves and our product is like, where is there an inconsistency or where are there gaps? Where do I wobble? And what they say with begin with trust is ultimately Everybody wobbles in some 
one of these pillars. Um, typically, we're good at two of these, but it's hard to nail all three. But if we can, we can ultimately create a strong sense of trust. So, um, yeah, I think if I could, if I could quickly just apply this to to software development. Um, obviously, logic is it needs to make sense. It needs to have a function, like, as I mentioned. Uh, empathy is this company cares about my well-being. This care company cares about the world. Um, I do personally think initiatives and taking action, not sending an email or uh, a newsletter saying like, we care, but actual initiatives show your audience. They can trust you. You care. You're trying to funnel this, you know, the profits or whatever the resources back out and create this feedback loop. Again, purpose product. It's a, it's a feedback loop. It's ongoing. There's not I think it's very, um, we're very misaligned if we think it's just a means to an end where we just want to make a bunch of money and then go live in a mansion. If that is you, let's get coffee. I would love to talk more um, about why. But uh, ultimately, another layer here in product design, if I'm applying it to myself and my work as a product designer, I really believe that user research lives between the content of what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it and validating it with our users and uh, you know, in the world. And then my user experience side of things is why I'm doing it and how I can uh, make it more compelling and engage my audience, make it desirable. And then the what and the how is the user interface, like I mentioned, the visual elements, interactivity, um, that kind of thing. Uh, something else, software development, I, I believe this is only like a few years of leadership at Spotify. If anyone remembers this person's name, feel free to throw it in the chat, I apologize. Um, but ultimately there's this beautiful trinity now in software development where the product manager, product designer, and engineer can work in tandem. And what I would probably say is product manager governs the, the what and the why elements, the, the purpose of the company. Why, what do we need to create and why do we need to create it? Why is it good for our business? Why is it good for our users? Um, and this isn't to say the product manager only does this. All of this, as you remember from that first uh, image in the first slide, it's, an, it's a relationship. It's constantly in flow all around software development. So next, product designer, why we're doing something and how I can make it uh, you know, as compelling and as effective as possible. And then the engineer really governs what we're making and how is it feasible? How is it um, going to be built out, right? So... I wanna take a moment, everyone, to now take this and apply it to ourselves, apply it to our own work, um, our business, our product. So I want you to think of something that is really prevalent in your mind. Is it, is it your company? Is it a project you're working on? Is it um, a brand that you are connected with or working with? Um, and I'm gonna go through basically one really like overarching question for each of these pillars. Um, and as I mentioned before, if you're able to stick on until the end of this workshop, I've put together about um, six to seven questions for each that I feel like are really critical for identifying how these, these pillars are being really like, um, I guess, satisfied uh, and where we might be able to get more specific and get deeper. So if you stick around, then you will get that for you to take into your, the rest of your life. Um, so let's start with the first one. And since Simon Sinek said, start with why, let's start with why. Um, and a few just overarching things that I thought aligned with context. So this is the purpose, this is empathy, this could be initiative or impact, but again, it's fractal. So this could be a multiplicity of different things, but I want you to write down, if you have a pen and paper, or if you have a place in your computer, you can just jot this down. I wanna take like, uh, let's take 60 seconds to just write down how does my business brand or product relate to what's happening in the world right now and go. And as you're writing this, you know, this could be extremely clear. You've already defined this really specifically. This could be, um, a few different versions. I just want you to write the first thing that comes into your mind. Um, I, I'm a big believer in instinct and impulse. Um, and you might also notice that perhaps there are some, you're not really 
uh, generating a lot of ideas around this and that's good, that's okay. That means there's an opportunity here. Um, so let's take another 20 seconds. How does my product relate to what's happening in the world right now? Beautiful. I know, I know 60 seconds goes by very quickly. So I'm gonna give you another 30 seconds just to keep writing because I feel like it can take about 30 seconds for our brains to sort of the engine to go. And you could also make this in bullet points where maybe to add on to this, don't just answer how does it, but how could my business relate to what's happening in the world right now. I think that's a really interesting take as well. Where is the opportunity? We're doing so well on time that I'm glad we're taking, taking a moment for this because I think Getting to apply this to ourselves is probably the most valuable part of this whole workshop. Great. And let's stop there. Let's hold. Um, so drop your pens, still your fingers, um, and just reflect on that moment. Like just kind of scan through and maybe if you want, if you want to circle or underline, what are some words or phrases that really like stood out to you that feel like we're very, yes, that is something that feels right. Um, or yes, this is something, there's an opportunity here that maybe I might have missed or hadn't thought about before. And just let's take like 30 seconds, just quickly go through and highlight anything that could be there, or perhaps there are more opportunities that you didn't, hadn't considered before. Great. Let's move on to the next pillar. We're going to look at contrast now. So this is active. This is about authenticity. This is about being engaging. And also very important is like contrast is adaptive. So it's not, I feel like content can be what it is, but contrast is constantly adapting to the environment, to our users. So I, the big question here is what distinct, distinguishes my product or business or brand from others in the space? and go. Let's take two minutes. So I'll give you some, I'll, I'll give you some extra time. And a few different ways to think about this question, right? You know, how does my product or business stand out amongst others in this space? And really try, I always like, whenever you think you got it, Go deeper, get even more specific. And really question, is, is there more? All right, let's take like another minute. And uh, in the same vein, also ask yourself, how could my product or business stand out from others in this space? What are other ways? And there's no wrong answers here. You could literally, you could literally say we, I don't know, I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna say like we sell dragons. <laughs> if that aligns with your product, that'll stand out. Um, <laughs> so take another 15 seconds. Um, and if you are finished, take a moment, look back and be like, okay, what, what here really feels aligned? Mm, what feels a little fluffy? What feels a little general? Because ultimately in storytelling, specificity is key. It is literally so important. To generalize in storytelling is the death of story. Um, the more specific we can be, the more we connect with the story, our audience, and ourselves. Um, because also by doing this, you're also perhaps learning a bit more about why you're doing this, why you are a part of this company. And I think even... You know, playing devil's advocate, if I were working at a company that maybe 
isn't my life's purpose. Um, I'm doing it because mama needs the mama needs the coin. You know, there are still ways to find opportunities to make it better, to you know, inspire others, and you know, help evolve the consciousness of your company or your product. I think that's also key. I think sometimes we're just we're like, it's it, it is what it is. No, you have the ability to create contrast to pioneer. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get off my soapbox and we'll move to our final pillar here, which is, of course, content. This is our, this could be seen as the product itself. This could be, this is like a, the logic behind it. It's functional. It's intentional. And just whatever this question means to you, what do I want my audience to accomplish? What do I want my audience to accomplish by using my service, my product? my business. And I think as you're writing, just let my voice fade into the background. I'm thinking like there's ex an example might be, um, you know, I want my audience to, to play and to have fun. How can you go deeper? What do you mean by that? What, what, what do they get out of this by engaging with your content? Because we've, bye Eric, nice to see you, thank you. And uh, on this, in the same vein, why don't you just quickly jot down opportunities that you didn't consider before? As many as you think, take like 30 seconds. All right, five more seconds and then drop your pens. Great, all right. So thank you for going through that exercise with me. I feel like um, I would also love to hear how these questions affected you. So like, what came up for you? Was it really hard? Was it really easy? Did you find that answering one of these questions was a lot easier than the others? I think even just by doing that, you start to understand instinctively or impulsively where there might be missed opportunities or where you can dig deeper. Um, so what we say um, at Rebus with our story consultations is like we're mining a mountain. So um, we gotta go into the mountain, we gotta dig. That's where all the gems are, the nuggets. So um, this is really about mining this like mountain, if you will, right? Um, so all of this to stay. <laughs> I, this is an assumption, but I assume you want to have a successful business product or experience, right? Um, and in my mind, true success is maximizing the extent to which you can connect and transform your audience. So again, if success to you is making the most money, getting the most followers, I'll let you think about that. Um, because I think that connecting and transforming an audience in any capacity creates a long lasting relationship um, that will ultimately, <laughs> by focusing on these elements, connect with your audience on a much deeper level, keep them engaged, and inspire them to do so much more. And that ultimately becomes emergent. It's fractal. There's so many more opportunities that emerge when you approach your product, your business from this story perspective. And that is ultimately what I love about stories and what I love about bringing this into my work as a product designer. Um, and just in a collaborative space altogether. So thank you all so, so much for going through that and digesting some of that with me, doing this exercise. Um, we have about like 10-ish minutes, so I would love to answer some questions. Um, if anyone has any thoughts, feel free to either um, unmute yourself and just like chime in or feel free to throw it in the chat. And I, I'm, I'm happy to just sort of like clarify anything, give you some more insight or um, information. And also, as you can see, some more fun QR codes. So first and foremost, I would love it if um, everyone could take three minutes to just give some quick feedback about 
this and what you thought. Um, and if you do so, then you will receive your very own in-depth storytelling guide that you can uh, really layer onto your product or business. And then please follow Taylor Roo Collective on LinkedIn. And if you are interested in what we're doing at Rebus with story, if you have a story that you want, would like to get some support on, shoot me an email. Um, I'd love to connect. All right. That was so swift. That was like so much faster than I thought it was going to be, but that's great. I love being, love being early. <laughs> I had a quick question. Um, I have two types of customers. Um, I'm in the healthcare space. So really three, um, we've got our payers or providers like healthcare systems, and then also the patient at the end of the day, that's like our end user. We lost you. We heard end user. Oh no. The Zoom Doom. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah, we got you. Um, so you uh, said. Uh, so, yeah, so I'm just wondering how, yeah, how to tell a story when there's these three audiences. So you, you uh, can you just quickly list out the three one more time? Yes, patients, uh, healthcare systems like hospitals or clinics and even doctors within that, and then uh, payers like insurance companies. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think my first thought is um, to think of these three sort of audiences as pillars. So where do these three live in, in, in the ecosystem of your business, perhaps? Um, it's hard to like, Obviously with product design, we try to focus what is our target audience, but with your business, there are a few different audiences that you're catering to. So I, I mean, personally, I feel like you kind of have to define this specifically for each audience. Um, it's gonna be more difficult to group them all into one. I think by grouping them all into one as an audience is more aligned with what is your purpose? What are you trying to solve for? Um, why and how is it? gonna how does it manifest but ultimately looking at these three different audiences and ultimately if I was a product designer I would be thinking about these three different audiences from three different angles because they are have different needs different behaviors different beliefs um, but I'd also be curious to know like where do the beliefs line up where do they intersect um, does that give you some insight Yes, definitely. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, that's a great question. It, it's also stimulating for me to think about. Um, I see some questions in the chat. If it's cool, I'll just kind of like go through some of that. Um, so one question is what happened two months ago to make me reconsider outcome versus output? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I was literally on a hike with my husband, who's a product manager. And he, I swear, he was the one that made me believe, I, I, I think I misinterpreted that he said, outcome is an end result and it's not good. But I think I just made that up in my head because we were talking and he was like, no, 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 no. Outcome is, must be broader. It's not just like to be work at Google. That's not an outcome. That's just another output to achieve an outcome. And I was like, kind of angry at him. Cause I was like, why didn't you tell me this sooner? Like I, I could have been at this workshop totally giving you wrong information. <laughs> But that's ultimately what inspired the switch. And I do have to say having a partner in this space is so helpful because he's able to sort of inject some of his wisdom onto me and I can share some with him. Um, and ultimately he used to describe his line of work by layering it over theater. So for example, is a director like the designer, is the product manager like the playwright, things like that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's where the switch really happened. And it actually gave me a lot more insight into like, I don't need to be afraid of outcomes. I just need to be more specific about it being a North star rather than just a destination. Cause a North star is something you're going towards. You're never, never gonna actually reach ideally. <laughs> um, yeah, so thanks for asking that question. Um, I see from two, why would, why, would the why be the same for the three audiences? Oh yes, um, I think this is a good follow-up and how, what are different or do you think the same? Um, I think that's a great question. I think I would urge, um, and I apologize, I didn't see your name, whoever 
ask the question, but I think that's a great question to solve for. Um, and I don't have the, the answer. Becca, yes. Um, but yeah, um, great. Any other thoughts? I'd also like if, if anyone wants to share anything that resonated with you or confused you, um, but otherwise happy to answer any more questions, feel free to jump in. Hi, um, I'm kind of curious because I know like the, the Trinity is very clear and very simple, but where like I run into issues in the past is where the intent of what I want to um, kind of ask and display people in a story versus how it's actually interpreted. Um, like, how do you make sure that your how is clearly mm -hmm. descriptive to your audience and that it's you're on the same page when you're telling mm -hmm. a story? instead of all right I think I'm describing this to my customer but this is actually what they're hearing yeah that's a great point because there can often be a disconnect between what we want our audience to experience and what they actually experience I feel like what I love about software development is the investment in researching and testing I think ultimately it's always not going to match up with what you expect to happen to your audience and that's why iterating and testing and how that's emerged in the space is so beautiful. And that's actually, I've brought that into the script development space for film and playwrights, uh, filmmakers and playwrights to apply agile, for example, to developing a script, because the problem is the playwright wants them to cry at this moment, but what if they don't? Um, what if they laugh, you know? Sometimes that's actually, that's really valuable information. And we often don't even test out a script until opening night. And then we get terrible reviews and we're like, why did, why was it so bad? Oh, because we weren't testing it. We weren't trying it out. So I would say like, just allow for, you know, as long as your intention is pure and you're clear on what you want your audience to experience and achieve, you need to leave space and room for them to play within that. I would say like, the last thing I would say about that is like, um, uh, what was I going to say? Like, I think that's why the how is not that the, the contrast or the how element is adaptive. It is constantly iterating and responsive to what your audience is doing. That's why I, I personally love AI and machine learning because it allows for such personalization and scalability. But, um, really focusing on the what and what happens, what is the function, what are they doing? And in storytelling, I focus a lot on verbs, active verbs. So they are doing this. What are the actions that you want them to take? And then ultimately, if they take other actions, that's probably the most valuable information. And like, I would say like, lean into that, lean into that discomfort. And I totally, I feel like I resonate with just like, that's not what I wanted them to do. Like, it's so annoying. Why are they doing that in an immersive experience that I create? Like, why are they walking in that room? Like the room was, the door's closed. This door's open. Why are they walking in the closed door? But perhaps it's because closed doors are more interesting and that creates more curiosity than an open door. That's obvious. In video games, <laughs> I love video games. And I always, you know, I start and it's like, go this way. And I'm like, I'm going to turn around and see what's underneath this rock. And like, you know, some video games, there are hidden Easter eggs. Other games, it's like, oh, no, no, no. I need to be going this way. So I think that point leads me to like, what are the rules and constraints? And this is one of the questions I ask in the, the guide is like, what are the rules of this world? And if you can communicate that sooner to your audience um, or teach them, and again, I'm applying this to immersive experiences for me is like, I need to know that like any locked door, any closed door that's locked is not meant to be opened. And then I will immediately know like, okay, well, I'm not gonna walk through closed doors. Um, things like that, I think also help to guide their behavior, but ultimately humans are so unpredictable and that's part of the beauty of it all, right? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll knock through these two final questions. And again, if you have a minute or two to shoot some feedback over and pick up that guide and let me know what you think. I would love that, but um, 
yes, I, I, I see some questions around my theater background. Um, I have so many improv exercises that I use. <laughs> um, I feel like in facilitation, improv improvisation is like number one. And I've also done this as a game facilitator, game designer for the Go game and Patchwork Adventures is like um, being able to respond in time. I think, please reach out Becca in terms of exercises because I can jot some down for you, but ultimately it's a yes and mentality, which I think is obvious to those that know improv, it's you say yes and. Um, so just trying to encourage, listen. I think that's another element of improvisation is listening. Um, I think sometimes similar to this pillar of trust, like we focus so much on logic and getting the point across without actually be making others feel heard or listened to. So in a discovery session, I wanna make sure everyone's voice is getting heard, but I'm still also guiding and, uh, and that's what I'll say too, is the action. That's why action in, an, in a scene, in an improvisational scene, I need to know what I need to do and I need to know what I need to, what is my objective? So I think being clear on what your objective is in, in a session as well is really key. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, we're at one. So I wanna thank you all so much for being here, showing up, engaging. Please, please, please shoot me an email, connect with me on LinkedIn, follow Taylor Collective. If you are interested in our work as a Taylor Collective, please, we'd love to talk. Um, if you are a designer or a researcher also, we'd love to talk. Um, so thank you all so much. And thank you too, and for hosting and helping me share all of this. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of your day, okay? Yeah, have a beautiful rest of your week. Thank you, thank you.